Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you to all of you for coming this evening, especially to Mrs. Rose. It's such a pleasure to see. And I think um, you all join me in believing that uh, there's nothing uh, quite so, uh, understanding the development of the brain and how our feelings and emotions and ideas and behaviors emerge. It's certainly one of the most daunting and exciting problems in biology and a daunting and exciting problem as a parent. So I hope that by the end of the night, uh, I can give you some of the basic principles of this process uh, and also shed light on some of the issues that might uh, be important uh, as par in parents and science. So I want to start uh, the evening by introducing my great nephew, Jackson, who's running down the stairs at breakneck, breakneck uh, pace. And I want to make the point in showing him that brain development is a dynamic process, and it's something that begins in the womb and continues all through childhood into um, young adulthood. And as a, a developing uh, developmental neurobiologist, one of my main interests is how the architecture of the brain develops, how the cells get into place so that the circuitry of the brain can develop. So as a good architect, we want to compare the brain with other parts of the body. And one of the most compelling aspects is that unlike the skin or the heart or, or the liver or other uh, areas of the body that have a handful of cells, at most a dozen, arranged in a reasonably simple way, uh, which might be very much akin to Frank Lloyd Wright's Prairie House. The glorious brain uh, has as its structure uh, a multi-layered complex structure, more like the Lieber House on Park Avenue. And this is a structure whose hallmark is the different layers, and it is the construction of these layers that sets the scene for the development of the circuitry and behavior uh, in the brain. Within the brain, there are 100 billion neurons. There's more than 1,000 kinds of cells. Uh, and so the difference in complexity between the brain and other uh, areas of the body is immediately obvious. But what I want to talk to you tonight about is how this develops. And in this picture, let's see, I guess I better get the pointer, um, of the brain. Uh, this is familiar to most of you as the cerebral cortex, the thinking center of the brain. And this part of the brain, which my lab has always been very interested in, is called the cerebellum, which literally means little cortex. Um, nonetheless, these can be looked at in cross-section and when we look in cross-section at the cerebral cortex, what we see are these series of layers, um, as I suggested from the Lieber house. And then as we go down into the layers, we see hundreds of thousands of beautiful cells. And these cells uh, don't populate the layer like a Park Avenue apartment where there would be a very low density of people. This is more like a, a level at giant stadium where there would be hundreds of thousands of neurons functioning in each uh, of the layers of the brain. So as we look at how the brain develops, um, we see that it actually comes about as a very simple structure, this little tube I hope you can see. And then over the first uh, month of life, this tube begins to fold and fold up, especially in the part that's up near the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex begins to emerge by several months of life. And then between five months and nine months, the basic architecture that I showed you just a moment ago is set forth by a program of uh, migrations and cell assembly. So the basic steps that I want to talk to you about tonight in building the brain are these. And that is that nerve cells are born on the inside of that little tube that I showed you in its very specialized zones. That the young neurons migrate away from the site where they're born and they go out through the wall of the developing cortex where they assemble into layers. And then after these layers form, once the neurons are in position, young neurons begin to form connections and to function uh, as circuits. So one of the things that you can keep in your mind, perhaps, is as the brain is developing, there are a series of temporary scaffolds, uh, much like we build um, skyscrapers here in New York, that uh, allow the brain circuitry to develop. In this little drawing, um, we can see that the brain cells are dividing in these special zones called ventricular zones. Uh, this is a picture from the mouse brain. And as these cells divide, some of them leave the cell cycle or finish dividing. And then these begin to make the beginning of the scaffold. Uh, the first area called the preplate. And then after that, other cells follow and they come one after the other migrating across a cell that stretches all the way across that tube called a glial cell, which in Greek means glue. So this glial cell or glue cell is the one that, that brings the cells from one side to the other. 
And it's rather like uh, the development of the American continent because the first neurons to be, to be born uh, go to the, are, are perhaps landing on the East Coast, and then the subsequent uh, generation of neurons goes a little bit further into, say, Kentucky and the Ohio Valley, and then the next generation goes a little bit further into the middle of the country and to the westward and so on. And this analogy is actually apt because if we were the size of neurons, we would have as far to walk in our journey on these migrations as uh, a pioneer would have had walking from one side of the country to the other. So these uh, migration events and these assemblies into layers are important for uh, a number of reasons, and not the least of which is it helps us understand things like childhood epilepsy. Epilepsy is a disease that can range from a very small cohort of lost cells that can fire abnormally, and sometimes uh, children can grow out of that, to more severe disorders, um, syndromes such as autism uh, and schizophrenia. We know this is uh, true, too. The other thing that's so important about the brain that I mentioned before is the number of different cell types. I'm showing you the cerebellum, the little cortex, because it's simpler and there are fewer cell types, and I actually can actually put them all on one figure for you. And here they are with the genetic technique that we can use to make them green so that we can see how beautiful the different cell types are, uh, juxtaposed with a drawing of the different cell types from Ramoni Cajal from, from the 19th century. So we need to generate lots of different types of cells, and we need to put them into layers for the circuits to begin. So here's a section through the brain again. So here's a special zone where the cells are dividing, and then they're pouring across this wall of the cortex. And some years ago, Pashko Rakic uh, hypothesized that the glial cell that I mentioned would be the guide for these cells to undergo these migrations. And then our laboratory uh, was actually the first to use microscopy to prove that this was a dynamic process. And here you can see the cell actually migrating along. So they're, they're migrating along as you go. This is a very delicate and important process uh, that begins between the fifth and ninth months in the womb. And it's a process that depends a great deal on the health of the mother, as things like alcohol and cocaine, radiation, all sorts of environmental insults will kill migrating cells uh, and cause uh, various brain abnormalities. So we can see this as MRI has, of course, uh, taken a large part in all of our lives. We can see that there are a, whole, a wide range of developmental disorders which can be laid at the feet, uh, at, the, at the base of defects in, in migration. These include a small brain, lysencephaly, a brain where there's a doubling of the size of the brain, and so on. There are many of these. One that's been particularly interesting, so this is an MRI that's a slice through the brain, is called lysencephaly, and lysencephaly means smooth brain. And this brain is smooth because there's defects in the proliferation of the cells, you don't get enough cells, and also in the migration of the cells so that you don't get as many layers and these little gyri uh, forming. So there are two genes that are responsible for this, so the lysencephaly gene itself, LIS1, or the X-linked uh, double cortex, uh, which is, we know um, uh, causes this uh, malady. So there are uh, important events as, as the brain develops, and all of these relate to changes in gene expression. And it is the control of genes, of course, that sets forth this program that involves the birth of the neurons, the migration of the neurons, then the outgrowth of connections or axons between the neurons, which um, Mark Tessier-Levine, of course, is one of the world's experts on, the formation of special connection, connections between the cells called synapses, uh, and then what's called plasticity these days, which is remodeling of connections uh, between cells as the nerves grow. I want to show you uh, just a few pieces of data tonight, but this is one. It's actually much simpler than it looks, and this is called a heat map. And it's called a heat map, and this is 20,000 genes at a, at, a, at, a, at a viewing, where we can look at how all the cells, all the genes are changing in an individual identified cell during development, from birth to the neonatal period to the juvenile period, young adult and adulthood. And it's called a heat map because the, the genes that are at the highest levels are painted red on the on this, uh, on this slide. And so what we see is that early on during birth in the neonatal period, when we're generating the cells and migration is ongoing, that most of the genes in this period are involved with growth and migration and connections. And then later on, other genes take, take hold that are involved with forming connections, refining connections, and strengthening connections um, between cells. So gene expression studies uh, can be viewed from sort of two different uh, uh, viewpoints, one from the, the airplane up above, or macroeconomics, you can look at thousands of genes at once, and many of you maybe have been reading all sorts of studies that will look at changes in gene expression on the level of thousands of genes 
in complex disorders like autism. Uh, or you can use them to go down and look at individual genes and or sets of genes in, in path, what are called pathways. And this allows us to identify genes and pathways that control the basic steps in development that I mentioned to you. It's important to note that the mutation for different genes are at different sites in the DNA, and we can actually test the function of these mutations in bioassays, where we can watch the cells in action and see what difference a particular mutation made uh, to the cell. And this is something that my own lab has been particularly interested in doing over the years. So we like to use a lot of microscopy. Yogi Berra is one of my heroes, and although the baseball season is over, uh, I like this saying by him, you can see a lot by looking. And so indeed, one of the things that we've done is to develop more and more refined forms of microscopy so that we can see more and more and more detail. This is a movie that was made uh, in my laboratory in 1986. It's the movie that proves that neurons migrate on glia. So here's a young neuron. It's got a little process that's dancing out in front of the cell. And this is the glial fiber, which at this magnification would range all the way from, say, um, the, the Hudson River across the East River. So the cell is migrating along. And as it goes, the migration of this cell called the granule cell, the immature cells extend this leading process. Uh, this is a rather long lead in. I'm sorry for that. And then they move along. And as it goes, little, little um, lamellipodia and phyllopodia, little projections of the cell, wrap around the, the, the neuron, as, the glial process as it goes. So here we'll watch it. Here's the nucleus in the back of the cell. Here's this leading process. And we see that it has a junction underneath where it's sticking onto the glial fiber. And then in just a minute, it's going to let go. And as it let go, lets go, you're going to see the cell glide along. Now it's going to glide along this glial process um, and make another step. Now what's important to remember about this is this happens every three minutes. And all of the brain cells in your brain were put into place by that delicate little uh, do, -si do of the cell moving along. We did a lot of experiments on migration over the years. We did biological experiments where we took neurons from one region of the brain on a walk on glia from other regions of the brain. And with this, we could ask very basic questions like, where's the information? Is the information in the young neuron or is the information in the glial fiber that it's traveling along? And what we found was that the information was indeed in the neuron and not in the glial fiber. And the glial fiber was really something like a monorail on which the, glial, the neuron would do this specialized form of <clears throat> the specialized form of motility. So it's rather like uh, neurons driving on the interstate highway system, and the navigational instructions, that is the genes, are in, are in the neuron, not the glial fiber. We've done many other types of experiments, identified some 80 genes that are involved in neuronal migration, identified genes that set the pace, set the orientation, the polarity of movement, genes that provide the motors, and one of the other things that's been the most interesting to us is what genes bind the neuron to the glial fiber. What help it tell, help the young neuron tell the glial fiber uh, the crop, proper way to migrate from being lost. And one of these genes we named, uh, discovered some years ago and named astrotactin. And it's actually astrotactin, this glue that's sitting underneath, you can't see it, uh, but unless we were to stain for it, but that's sitting underneath the cell body of the neuron just before, as it's pausing in between uh, these steps. So over the years, we've studied a great deal um, about astrotactin. And in the last two or three years, we've made a discovery that surprised us a great deal. And that is that there are two astrotactin genes, not one. Now, that's not so surprising. Usually, genes appear in families. But in, in general, if one has two different genes, particularly adhesion genes, they're what's called redundant. They back each other up. But in this case, the two genes are expressed at completely different times. So one gene is expressed during this period of migration. And the other gene is expressed at that time, but also later in the adult, well after migration is finished, after the lever house is up, and after the circuitry is working. And then the other thing is that's been very exciting is in the last year, there have been seven or eight papers showing that migration in the second one, uh, mutations in the second one, not the first one, are detected in patients that have these great developmental defects, particularly autism, schizophrenia, and attention deficit uh, disorder. So this is a complicated slide, but I can't resist showing it to you because it's one of the most uh, compelling and interesting things we're working on in the lab at the moment. And that is that you can map out a gene. Genes have different parts, uh, like everything else in life. And if you map out the part of the gene that's involved in autism, that's these little blue lines up at the top, versus the parts of the gene that are mutated or defective in schizophrenia, 
what you see is that these map to completely different parts of the gene. I show this to you because it's the first time that I've ever seen this happen, and my colleagues uh, haven't seen uh, this sort of thing very often either. And it's one of the things that we're working on the hardest is to understand how it is that this part of the gene affects a disease as complicated as autism, and this part of the gene affects a disease as complicated as schizophrenia. So what is the function of this second astrotactin? Is it an adhesion protein? Does it bind? Is it a glue like astrotactin 1? No. And the reason we know that is because it's not, it's in the membrane, but it's not actually sticking out on the cell, so it can't glue one cell to the other. Does it interact with astrotactin? Yes, it does, and I'll show you that in just a second. Well, is astrotactin 1 the only thing on the earth that it's put here to interact with? No. It interacts with other proteins, and it controls the levels of proteins in the surface. So what we discovered was that actually astrotactin 1 is the glue that's keeping the cell in place in between these steps along the glial fiber. And then it's astrotactin 2, its family member, that pulls it out of the membrane and then initiates uh, a, a recycling of the protein. So proteins like uh, Coke cans and the rest uh, are, are reused or not tossed away at the drop of a hat, and these are recycled. And one of the main um, things that's going on during motility and discovery that we made about a year ago is that these proteins are recycled, and they're recycled in this very unusual way where, where one family member is regulating the pace of the other family member uh, through the cell as it goes. So what other proteins is it interacting with? Well, I just showed you that it interacted with astrotactin 1, and that explains how it's involved in migration. But then here came the surprise, and that is it's not only interacting with astrotactin, but it's interacting with these long-named things that have to do with synapse formation and synapse turnover. And so we know that astrotactin 2 is important for migration early on, and we now turn our attention to the fact that it may also be important for synaptic plasticity once the neurons are in, are in, in place. So after this process that I love so much of migration is, is finished and the neurons are in the right place, they have to make the right connections. And here's a picture of a young ner of a nerve cell, and all these little dots on here, I'll put a red circle around one of them, are what are called synapses, and these are the connections between nerve cells, and here's one blown up so that you can see it. And it's from one gap across this gap called a synapse that information flows from one cell to the other. Nerve cells are quite remarkable. There are about a billion, 100 billion nerve cells in the brain, and there are more than a trillion connections. So nerve cells can make hundreds or thousands, or sometimes hundreds of thousands, of connections. And like us, they tend to use the connections that they use the most, they phone the most, they text the most, whatever, uh, are the ones that are the strongest. Um, so these uh, are essential for the circuitry to work. And the protein that astrotactin is interacting with is a protein that has to do with eliminating synapses, with turning them over, with getting rid of various people on Facebook. And <laughs> the other thing that's interesting about these little synapses is that the mechanism of them, this recycling that I just showed you a moment ago uh, in the cell as it's recycling its adhesion protein, we can see that it, this, the synapse works the same way, that these little packets, let's see if I can do this. Oops, wrong way, sorry. These little packets of information that are flowing across are actually uh, in little vesicles and, oops, going the wrong way, I beg your pardon. And these vesicles are recycling uh, in much the same way that the, prote that the adhesion proteins are recycling in uh, the, the migrating cell. So the main thing that we're working on right now is whether astrotactin is controlling, astrotactin 2 is controlling synaptic plasticity by, by controlling uh, the formation and elimination of these synapses, possibly in a way that involves um, the uh, um, recycling of these, of these uh, vesicles. So also, as nerve cells um, develop, they extend more and more branches as they make more and more connections. And I want to mention to you this important aspect of development of, of neurons called a critical period. Perhaps many of you have heard about the critical period. This was coined by David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Torsten Wiesel, of course, was the president of the Rockefeller for many years. I'm happy to say he's one of my mentors in science and was the president who recruited me here. And the critical period is the window of time during which particular types of connections are made. So connections in the sensory system versus connections in the visual system versus connections in the auditory system. There are critical periods for all of these things, critical periods when you can learn language, critical periods when your vision develops. And one of the most important things about understanding these critical periods 
is that intervention depends on acting within the critical period. So for example, in the visual system, cataracts are a very common uh, developmental defect, and one has to uh, correct these cataracts during uh, this so-called critical period. So the connections uh, are made, and the, then the, the uh, processes grow out uh, and, and, and um, make uh, these criti critical periods. So critical periods, uh, different parts of the brain are developing at different times. Now, this is Jackson's older brother, Ryan. And ja Ryan is six by now. So his language areas and areas of critical reasoning are developing, and so is a mind of his own. And so when I wanted to take Jackson, uh, Ryan's picture the same day, he, of course, showed me his back. And then I told him, well, that's great. I'd love to have a picture of your back. And then I got the reaction. <laughs> so the New York Times actually had this wonderful set of drawings um, uh, it's, you can actually download it if you want to see it, about the fact that if you look at the brain and color the different regions of the brain, and different regions are responsible for processing different kinds of information, you see this time course of development um, of the brain. So here, at four years of age, the back of the brain where vision is, is blue because it's already developed. The sensory part of the brain is also blue. And the areas that are red and yellow are the areas that have yet to come into full, that are just developing these synapses, but have not come to complete maturity. Whoops, sorry. Have to see. So as we go to six years of age, now language, not just saying a word, but putting language together in a complex way is coming online. Reasoning, uh, complex reasoning, mathematical skills are coming online. As you go to nine years of age, fine motor skills are becoming very acute. Mathematics is entering uh, the uh, repertoire. And we see these blue areas of the brain as the brain is turning from red and yellow to blue as these areas keep going. I could show you for 12 years and 15 years and so on, but the main point is the last one, and that is that even at 21 years of age, there's some slightly green areas of the brain. And so those of you who are upset with your children for not getting in that uh, college application should keep in mind that the brain is still developing at this age and that the and that the uh, connections and critical periods for some parts of the brain, like the frontal cortex, aren't until quite late uh, in adolescence. So these critical periods then have a time course to them. And the time course uh, is important. As it's said, timing is everything. And we know this is important. Whoops, let me go back. Uh, timing is important because the time course of this development, uh, this changing and the shading of the different development of specific areas of the brain that are responsible for different types of modalities in the brain, uh, the timing is important. And these timing can be abnormal in diseases like schizophrenia and epilepsy uh, and learning disabilities. So each of these is a subject unto itself. But it's important to realize that we're looking at a brain that's developing over a very long period of time, and certainly not just in the womb, and certainly not just in a toddler and a young child. Let's see. So the very last slide I want to show you is that over the last few years, it's become very exciting. Stem cells have become a very exciting uh, part of developmental biology because we can take what we've learned from the development of the brain, and we can now take skin cells uh, or other non-neuronal cells and do what's called reprogram pram reprogramming them, I beg your pardon, to make them be multipotent and then to direct them over towards a neuronal fate, which is, of course, our favorite. Then we can do experiments like implanting them into mice to be able to test the function, the function in this case being migration. Here's a cloud of these cells that we've put into the brain, and we can actually watch them migrating. So the reason that we're excited about this is we can take fibroblasts from patients who are unfortunate enough to have developmental brain disorders, particularly those that, with astrotactin that my lab is interested in. And we can ask whether the neurons that can be gotten from those fibroblasts have defects in migration, have defects in, in synapse formation. What is wrong with these cells? And we hope that by doing this, we'll be able to discover in much more detail not only how the basic form of the brain develops, but what goes wrong uh, in these diseases. Whoops, keep going the wrong way. I beg your pardon. So what I've tried to tell you about tonight, uh, starting with Jackson, uh, is that gene expression patterns control the formation of the brain by controlling the development of many different types of cells and their generation on a timetable. 
uh, uh, in the young uh, brain, and that the young neurons migrate away from the sites where they're born, and they develop into layers, much like the Lieber House on Park Avenue, and that this laminar architecture is absolutely critical to set the stage for synaptic circuitry, and that one gene among many that our lab happens to be very interested in, called astrotactin-2, is important for both migration and for synaptic function, and we hope may give us further insight into some of these devastating diseases like autism and schizophrenia. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, many of whom are here tonight, Robert Fryer, Hurinaz Behesti, Eve Ellen Govek, Keisha John, Xiaodong Zhu, Alexandra Glashi, Yin, Yin Fang, uh, and people who've left the lab, Perrin Wilson and Stephanie Schneider and David Selecki, uh, for doing all the work that I uh, alluded to tonight. Uh, and also our support comes from the NIH, the NINDS, from the NISTEM, from Rockefeller University, and I'm very proud to have the Frederick P. Rose Professorship for which uh, I'm very grateful. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Mary, Mary Beth, for a fascinating lecture. Um, we have time for questions, and there are three roving microphones. I would ask that you wait until you get the microphone before asking your question so everyone can hear it. At what um, age levels have you found the critical periods to be for um, things such as autism and ADHD and the like? Well, these are complex um, disorders, and as you, as you may be well aware, uh, differences in the development uh, of, of autism involves many different parts of the brain, particularly the visual area of the brain. So it's going to involve many different critical periods, I would say, uh, for, for those parts of the brain that are, that are uh, involved. I'm sorry not to give a, be able to tell you a more specific number. Towards the beginning of uh, your presentation, you showed a slide um, showing the development of uh, the fetal brain. Mm -hmm. And um, I was curious, uh, it seemed that the brain was changing a lot between even eight and nine months. Um, and I was curious whether there was a difference in development or the structure of the brain for children who may have been born prematurely, say, after eight months of pregnancy, and therefore may have been stimulated by the outside world, as opposed to children who may have grown through nine months in utero? Yes. Well, there are, of course, differences um, in children that are born prematurely. They tend to develop a little more slowly for the first few years of life. Actually, Bob Fryer is here, uh, who works as one of my colleagues, who's a child neurologist, who can correct me if I'm wrong. But then, uh, it, as time goes on, although you're correct that it takes a little longer uh, for the brain to develop normally outside of the womb, uh, these children do catch up, and these children um, thrive. Is that what you? There are so many questions going around in my head. This is extraordinary, and I know everyone feels, I'm sure, the same way. But to what extent does nature versus nurture, particularly in, in conjunction with this gentleman's uh, last question about the development of the brain in a premature child, then let's say the child's born at seven or eight months, at some point you're, you're not only dealing with the nature of it, but the, the nurturing side of it. And in conjunction with that, if there is a head injury, for instance, which damages the developmental, uh, one particular area of the brain that's developing, um, is there anything that can be done to affect that, either via gene mutation or some other avenue? You've asked a lot of questions. Let me, let me try to parse them out um, a little bit. Um, the first is uh, nature versus nurture. And I would say that the basic plan for developing the brain is in the genome. And so the basic formation of the architecture, the basic formation of the synapses, the formation of uh, different types of cells, Harry versus Joe, this is all in the genetics. And then what can take nurturing is that the development intensity of the development, especially when I showed you the two cells uh, where one had few, fewer little spines than the other ones, that's actually a picture of a rat that's in a cage versus that has things flying around for him to look at versus those that don't. So certainly nurturing, reading to children, showing them visual stimulation, all of this is very important. But forming the basic topography of the brain, the basic organ of the brain, this is in the, this is in the genome. Now, as far as trauma to the brain is concerned, um, this is something that Mark actually knows more about than I do, but one thing that is true is that uh, young brains develop much more much more fully 
than do older brains. And part of this is because either other parts of other areas can take over, or since it's not quite formed anyway, it's easier perhaps to, to correct some of, the, some of the damage. That's not to say that it'll be perfect, but there's a lot, an awful lot of, um, of recovery from injury in, in younger brains as compared with even adolescent and, and older brains. I don't know if Mark wants to. That's exactly right. The, as we age, we're less and less able to repair our brains after injury. Nutrition and vitamin supplements and that sort of thing, how much does that play into the, uh, the encouragement of uh, development? Well, basic nutrition is certainly one of the primary forces behind this genetic plan that I was telling you about. And malnutrition is, is something that causes defects in migration and, and as we know, uh, mental retardation in some cases. So nutrition is a broad range of things, but malnutrition is something that's indeed very dangerous, and it's something that we can all uh, make sure doesn't happen to any little child on the earth. And it's some one very easy step that we can take to improve brain development all over the world. Um, the second question was, I'm sorry, I forgot. Oh, vitamins and so on. Um, I'm not going to uh, go too far out on that limb since most of the information that one gets uh, these days is that taking too many vitamins doesn't always turn out to be a positive thing. So I think good nutrition, uh, certainly you know, uh, nursing and so on, all these things, but basic nutrition is what's needed for the brain to develop. Nothing above and beyond that. If you want to comment on any of these things, Mark, please. Yes. Okay, sorry, good evening, uh, and thank you very much. To what extent does stress play uh, in the effect of the migrating cells? Well, stress plays a big effect on the mother, of course, and uh, the mother under severe stress will release uh, hormones, particularly cortisol. And although not too many studies have been done, the studies that have been done show that this can, as you would imagine, uh, be deleterious to migration. Now it's not as bad as alcohol and cocaine and others, but certainly stress, certainly trauma, certainly depression, all of these things uh, take their toll on, on uh, the developing child. I apologize if you've been asked this question many times before. Um, oh, that's it seems right. as if oh, thank you. the learning capability of the brain is infinite. Um, how much a, is that true, and how much of the brain do we, quote, actually use? Well, I'll let Mark comment on this as well, but every estimate that I've ever seen is not as much as we'd like to think. Um, so we're certainly, I mean, just on the level of what we're conscious of versus what we're not conscious of, I mean, from that very simple example, we know that our brain is doing many, many more things than we're aware of when we walk into some room that we haven't been into for 30 years and suddenly we remember every detail from, from the wallpaper or whatever. So I would say that you know, one of the things that many psychologists and, and cognitive scientists are very interested in now is how to maximize uh, our brain power. Uh, and I think we're just at the beginnings of understanding that, and, and certainly we don't uh, maximize it uh, today, I don't think. I don't know whether. I think that's right. Can you retrain the part that you use if there's a bad part or an effective part to do what it does in another part? Uh, yes, to, to a large extent. I mean, there, there are um, children who are born with, well, my own son was born with a defect in temporal processing of language. And so his ability to hear language, he hears everything as if, it's, as if you're speaking so quickly he can barely understand what you're, so it's all too fast for him. And so, yes, he's learned how to cope with his language being a little too slow, but the other side of him is that his visual abilities you know, are unbelievable, and he's a film editor because of this. And so I think there's always a balance, and although you might want to correct every little thing and have us all be the same, uh, there are also cases where strengths and weaknesses in the brain lead to great talent. Thank you. But I want to make just one comment. I think, I think the, the parenting part of it, though, is to realize that children who do have different, who do have deficits, so for instance, my child, with who had trouble learning everything by hearing it. You know, multiple modalities for teaching. So for him, he, he needed to hear it, and he needed to see it written, and he needed to see, you know, different kinds of modalities. And I think 
We all know that that's true because lots of times if you get nervous, you don't remember what somebody said to you and if you can write things down. And so I think the message from different parts of the brain, maybe not being perfect, is that uh, teaching with multiple modalities will be the way to um, access as much uh, capacity as there is. I'm sorry. What you just said raised another question for me, so I have two. Uh, in terms of your own son's development, did Fast Forward ever come in? Was that recommended, that program for helping kids deal with rapidly moving speech? Do you have any experience no, with he's, that? No, he's 29, so he didn't, he didn't get that one. You know, it's but, actually but the, used for adults now, so well, you haven't. I haven't mentioned that. Okay, then the second is um, in terms of ADHD. Uh -huh. um, has, have you done some research on that and is there anything you can share in terms of treatment and the understanding of it? I have not because uh, my uh, experiments all have to do with the early plat development of the platform and animal models of the brain. And so I'm not really able to comment on therapies for ADHD. There are, of course, many new therapies for it, but I'm afraid I'm not the one to comment on that. I'm sorry. Hi, um, I have a question regarding diagnosis of uh, disorders such as autism and ADHD. Um, are there factors that present that enable a physician uh, to, to make uh, a diagnosis with 100% certainty, or is it a scale, and, and how reliable are the diagnoses? Does it have to do with the skill of the physician? Is it, how does that work? The journal Nature, which is one of the most hallowed in our field, uh, just has an entire issue on autism. And I think last week there was a, uh, a very large scale study where it, it was asked if you um, take four or five great centers uh, of child neurology in the country and you looked at the criteria for the <coughs> diagnosis of autism. And so an, a child was, di was definitely uh, autistic at Hopkins. Would that same child be autistic at, at Columbia? And there was shockingly little correspondence between them. So I think the diagnosis of complex mental disorders, whether it's autism or depression or schizophrenia, is really at the heart of, of um, the problem with, with uh, developing therapies for them. And certainly autism uh, is, um, uh, can also have many parts. I think uh, children can be, can be seen, in the parts of the autistic uh, syndrome can be understood in very, very young children and yet other people will say it doesn't happen until the children are older and so on. So I think it, it depends on who's doing the diagnosing and, and the child in particular. Beautiful talk. I have an evolutionary neurobiology question. Oh, um, good. One could imagine a system of embryogenesis in which the neuron proliferation and occurs actually in situ in the cortex instead of doing the radial migration. The radial migration adds a you level. You can imagine that quite well from the frog down. So the radial migration adds a level of complexity that yeah. has potential for errors and listen right. right. What would be, do you have any speculation about what would be the evolutionary advantage of having radial migration as your method of? Yes, the, the advantage has been. So up until the frog, there's no radial migration. Uh, and so then after that in some birds and in higher, uh, in mammals, there is radial migration. And what's happened with the radial migration is with these layers, uh, the complexity of the circuitry that you can build uh, increases astronomically. Uh, and so that's the advantage. And actually, the percentage of children who are born with these malformations that I showed you, particularly the ones with the MRIs, listen cephaly, for instance, is actually a very rare uh, disease. So the advantage in terms of our um, cognitive abilities, uh, I think, far outweighs um, the uh, brain disorders, as tragic as they are, uh, for the human race at least. I have a very specific question. Um, has any of your research given any um, clues about what is happening in, in uh, disorders that are temporary, such as febrile seizures, yes. which may be, you know, come at one point and then the child eventually will outgrow them? Well, I can't say that my research has, but I can tell you that there certainly is research. So one of febrile seizures, uh, and Bob, wherever you are, please correct me if I'm wrong about this, but febrile seizures often represent a small number of cells that have aberrant migrations or aberrant gene expression. 
And so what will happen is that these cells will be misfiring uh, in the young child. And then with time, because they're not connected properly in the circuit, often these cells die and the, and the epilepsy, childhood epilepsy, often resolves as children get older. Bob, are you here? Do you want to make a comment about it? This is Dr. Robert Fryer. I'm actually a child neurologist, uh, so I know a little bit about this. Um, febrile seizures is actually a very interesting um, uh, problem in the brain because it's actually almost like a normal developmental process. We know that in children, there's like an age where the brain is more susceptible to generating a seizure if you uh, reach a certain fever. So, um, it, and it, there, you know, there is a, probably a genetic component to it, but most of these kids' brains look normal, at least by MRI. Um, but for the most part, uh, you know, this is almost like it's a normal part of the brain development, that there's some sort of um, correction, yeah, tendency of the young brain to seize when, it re when the temperature of the body reaches a certain point. Thanks, Bob. I was curious about um, when you talked about the stress hormone, cortisol affecting brain development, um, to what extent that's negative in the context of, say, like modern society versus the evolution of the human brain over the last 40,000 years? Because I imagine it would be, mm -hmm. I'm not a woman, but more stressful in a field. And so to what extent is that protecting the brain for a different type of environment? And to what extent is it actually negatively impacting the brain? or do we have a guess? There's no clear information on that. The studies that have been done have been, have, are studies of people who've been traumatized to the extent that they would have uh, um, post-traumatic stress. And post-traumatic stress is one condition where a lot of cortisol is released. I think all of us can imagine that low amounts of stress uh, are detrimental uh, both to adults and to children. Um, but in terms of specific studies on that. There are precious few on the traumatic studies, let alone these interesting, subtle questions that you ask. But anything you can do to keep stress down is probably a good thing. Well, I was thinking more in the context of if the brain is, has evolved to protect itself against stress. So in the very extreme cases, you know, you're having a baby next to a lion, but the baby has to live in a very stressful environment. Is the brain better at handling that stress because of the stress? Uh, I don't know that I can answer that question, but, but I do know that the, the human baby is a, is a remarkably resilient, uh, uh, wonderful little creature that can put up with an awful lot of stress uh, coming from us and from more extreme versions of ourselves. We, we have a um, question at the back there. It's not unrelated. Dyslexia, as I understand it, and perhaps Mark can, can comment on it, uh, dyslexia is related to parts of the brain that process visual um, information and also parts of the brain that process uh, reading. There's some 20, I, I remember reading this when my son was coming along, that uh, although there's only one or two parts of the brain that hear A, there's 20 different parts of the brain that see A, whether it be in a book versus a movie versus this versus that. And so there are differences in the processing of visual information. And there are many different complex etiologies, as far as I'm aware, uh, that can give rise to dyslexia, dyslexia. And there's no single, simple explanation that I know of. Yeah, the, the genetics are, are complex. And, but there are some uh, cases of uh, uh, genetic predisposition that seem to relate to migratory problems, so uh, brain cells going to the wrong places. But there seem to be lots of different ways in which you can end up with these temporal mismatches um, in the, uh, the, the, as you process the stream of information coming through, which gives rise to dyslexia. I wondered what um, therapeutic impact or what potential therapies you might see coming out of some of the research that your lab's doing with ASTM. Well, I think, I think the main, um, the main uh, excitement for us is the understanding that some, we know that uh, neuronal migration, as Mark just mentioned, is very important for a great many developmental disorders. But the idea that a gene that's so heavily involved in neuronal migration might again be used for synaptic pruning uh, is an economy of, of a sort that may help us understand uh, many more, get more bang for the buck than we had appreciated in terms of understanding both pruning of 
of synapses and migration uh, through the window of this one single molecule. I have more of a parental practical question. Ah. Uh, what do we know about concussions and the impact on brain development during the middle um, high school, middle or high school years? And what's the best treatment in order not to disturb the brain formation process? I think the best treatment is to avoid concussions. Uh, but I, I think we're learning more and more that uh, many of the games and so on that our children play uh, can end up in concussions and that these are a very bad thing for the brain at any age. And is there a, rest, is there a resting period then recommended for the child in order there to... There are such things, but I, it's, it's beyond my expertise to really comment on it. I'm sorry. So repetitive head injuries are, are much yeah. worse than you know, single-headed injury. and. Uh, it actually then veers into some of the pathological processes where you can get amyloid forming, the kind that, that normally appears only very late in life in Alzheimer's disease and things like that. That can be stimulated by um, a repetitive trauma to the head. So above all, you want to, if you had had one concussion, you want to avoid putting yourself in a situation where you're going to have that again. So my son, who's 14, said to me the other day, very depressed, that he doesn't believe that there's any uh, uh, way for us to evolve from where we are. He thinks that we've reached the end of our evolution. Oh. And um, I would Serious love- Serious young man. Yes. Well, I would love to be able to tell him that there is some research or some sort of documentation to show uh, that there's, there's, there's hope for us. There's more than research. There's, there's a great deal of genetic information that shows uh, that, that humans are changing. Uh, our genes are changing. Uh, many, many genes are changing uh, over time. And so we're clearly evolving. So he needn't worry that we're not. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about the um, children who don't develop the synapses or they, they kind of miss the critical period. Are activities like brain gym or other stimulating activities, does, do those really help um, the child's brain or help them to you know, maybe supplement the, yes. what they're lacking? I, I don't know about brain gym in particular, but what's always true is that the, the most help can be done during the critical period. But it's certainly not true that no help is available after that. So even though the maximal help is during the critical period, there are certainly many, many, many new teaching um, approaches and learning approaches that are coming online. And although they, might, they won't give you the 100% recovery that you might have gotten, uh, you can get an awful lot of benefit from those. And I think one of the greatest things that's happening right now is, all, is the evolution of teaching uh, techniques and the appreciation of the range of difference among children, uh, and that there may be children such as the one you're referring to. I'm sorry, that's all the time we have for questions. But...